Well, you know, a number of years ago, one Sunday evening in October, I had the privilege of being at Temple Baptist Church in Tennessee, the home of Brown College, and I had the privilege of preaching that night, and I was always taught that as you begin to preach, you should always try and start the message with something gripping and arresting. And so there were two and a half thousand American people in the congregation, and I said, I'm really thrilled skinny to see you all tonight. <laughs> and that perhaps wasn't quite the way to start because I had two and a half thousand American people looking absolutely mystified by this statement. But you English people, of course, you know what I mean by that. And Rose and I really are thrilled skinny that we're back with you tonight. It's been a couple of months since we've been here. And you're a part of our hearts and we love each one of you. I say, I say that sincerely. And I really praise the Lord for this church here. You know, we haven't been able to find an independent Baptist church of our persuasion in the Northeast yet. That says something, doesn't it? In the whole of the Northeast, as we've travelled around, we have found a dear group of Christians who we do meet with, and they are independent Baptists, uh, and we're happy to help them. But nevertheless, you folks have a special place in our hearts, and we're we're grateful to you. And uh, the people who we have been working with there in Hartley Paul, they've been a great blessing to Rose and I. One of the men has enabled us to cut lots of corners in uh, meeting other people, uh, particularly with our open air preaching and things, which it may have taken me years to do on my own. And so we're very grateful for their support and encouragement. And they've been very gracious and kind to Rose and I. But having said that, we do miss you, and uh, so we're, we're thankful for each of you. So continue to love one another and pray for one another and soul win together and uh, continue to go on. These are difficult times for the church, and I completely understand that. Now what we are doing in, um, in the Northeast really is uh, beyond my comprehension in the sense that um, either Ariko Kerry, I think, yesterday reminded me that last April we had the vision meeting. And last April, when part of the vision meet meeting, among many other good things, we mentioned about Mission Northeast, it was just a vision then. But it's an incredible thing in just relatively few months that that vision has become a fact. And uh, I mean, Rose and I didn't have a clue where we were going to live, we really didn't know nothing. Literally, you know. In fact, when we moved to Hartlepool, we knew no one. Literally, nobody. And yet, in the last four or so months, God has really blessed. And I believe that's a real answer to your prayers and a real answer to my prayers. So we are working with a small group of Christians. And um, uh, Kerry and Ulrika, I was able to show them just the church building yesterday where we're located on uh, a fairly well-populated um, uh, estate there. And we're just helping them when we can, and Rosalind plays for certain things. I had a funeral last week, and Rosalind was able to play. So we want to be a blessing to them, because they've been a massive help in practical ways to us. We also now have a, a city centre open-air preaching in five town centres. And again, that was really a result of the folks there in Hartlepool who put me on to other open-air preachers in the area. And we have had some significant inroads on the streets, particularly in South Shields, in South Tyneside. We actually have a congregation gathered to listen, sometimes congregation bigger than the one tonight. And that's amazing, really, for street preaching. And people stand and listen, and we've had some amazing <coughs> conversations. And probably we've given out, we estimate, around 25,000 tracks so far on the streets since we've been going out. And I believe that God can use those and the conversations and again that's a result of your prayers and we're grateful for that and then of course the big news really is that we're uh, trusting the Lord to start a work in Durham in April and so pray very much for that toward that and uh, Kerry's been such a blessing she's made some super super promotional cards for us to give out during March and so we'll be busy doing that and we're just going to start with a, a midweek meeting um, it's a student city, 15,000 students at the university, some part-time, some full-time, but 4,000 live in the residential area right next to, to where we're going to start this work. So we are really desirous to um, reach them with the gospel. And so we're going to start midweek, 
but we're, we've hired a building with, uh, and we're just going to start in a small room hall type of thing. But next door to that is available to us an auditorium which seats 400 people. And so that's it's one of the old, it's actually an old Methodist church with a balcony, you may picture it, but it's been renovated, it still has the balcony, and it's ultra modern now with all the safety things in, etc, etc. So that's available to us for a Sunday evening, a Saturday evening for evangelistic rallies. That really sounds good to me. I, I love evangelistic rallies like the old days. And it's also available for us for Sunday evening services as well. So, so pray toward that. But we're just going to start with midweek meetings because we need to meet some folks. We really, again, don't really know anybody as such in Durham apart from the people we've met on the street. But I really think there's some significant inroads can be made there into the hearts and lives of people. So thank you for your prayers. Everything is going better than I could have possibly expected. And I give God all the glory for that and also all your prayers. Our only hindrance, as always, has been Rose and I's health. So continue to pray for that because that still continues to be a problem. And we would, we would love you to pray for that. But we are really skew, uh, thrilled, Skinny, to be back here tonight. And we do love you and we're so pleased we can be a part of the church. So remember... You're doing, by our mission to North East, something which no other church of our persuasion, of which we know, have planted another church for donkey's years. And so, you know, uh, although sometimes you may come and you may think, well, uh, we're only small in number, you're really doing something significant by going planting a church in another area. That is not done very often now. And so we can praise God that he's allowed us all to work together. This is your work as well as our work, but primarily it's God's work. Amen. And because it's his work, it's going to work, folks. Because <laughs> God's work wo always works. So, so thank you so much. And Brother Chris, I'm really pleased to meet you tonight. We'll have a cup of tea together afterwards. Thank you so much for being with us as well. Okay, if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude, Jude, um, verse number 24, there's only one chapter, so there's no chapters involved. The book of Jude verse number 24 and uh, the Bible says there Jude verse 24 and we're, we are indeed and I didn't know that Pastor Jonathan was starting a series on Philippians but you'll be pleased to know Jonathan I don't think I really mentioned the book of Philippians tonight so you're going to have a, uh, an open door there but we are thinking tonight about the joy of the Lord and here in Jude, verse number 24, the Bible says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Let's read that again. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And so we're thinking tonight about this subject of joy. I don't know whether you've noticed, but there's so many miserable people in the world, isn't there? You know, if you, you would go to the average bus stop, particularly in Hartlepool, most people look as miserable as what the bus looks, you know? It's, it's an awful thing for, to be miserable. But there should be something different about Christians. And when we think about the joy of the Lord, it has to be said that in many Christian circles, there's a lot of nonsense spoken about joy. I think it was Brother Rob I was saying this morning. You know, some people think that joy is doing glory rolls down the aisle. Some people think that it's always happy clap or hallelujah Christians or praise the Lord Christians. And that may be part of it. But actually, joy, according to the Bible, is a deep inner sense within our spirit of contentment with what God has done for us and what he's given us and contentment that we're completely at peace with him and he's a boss, he's in charge, and we can completely trust him. That's actually what joy is. And we need to be careful that we don't muddle it up with some emotional type of uh, a feeling. Joy, really, Bible joy is a confidence standing on the promises, standing on the rock of Jesus. And come what may, even if our whole world collapses, we can still be joyful. We'll see that in a moment. So we definitely need to be concerned about what genuine Bible joy is 
And actually the Bible says a huge amount about joy. And so we're going to interrogate this subject with six questions tonight. And the first question is, where does genuine joy come from? Uh, and we'll find that out. How does the Bible, for question number two, how does the Bible describe genuine joy? Question number three, what causes genuine joy? Question number four, what types of genuine joy are there? And then question number five, why do so many Christians not experience genuine Bible joy? And you may fit in that category tonight. And if you do, we'll find out that you shouldn't do if you're a Christian. You should experience genuine Bible joy and there's no reason not to have that. And then the big question which we answer at the end is, what answer do I give to an unsaved friend when they say they have joy? You see, the average unsaved person tonight in Peterborough is going to say, well, I don't need Jesus Christ because I'm joyful, I'm happy. Let me tell you, that's rubbish. They're not really joyful and they're not really happy. And I'll show you that from the Bible tonight. Because you can't have joy outside of Jesus. And so the first thing tonight is to ask ourselves, where does genuine joy come from? And the answer is, of course, it's a supernatural joy. Genuine Bible joy comes from God alone, and you know the nine fruit, not with an S, the nine fruit of the Spirit, the second one is joy. Love, joy. Galatians 5 and verse number 22. We must remember the source of genuine Bible joy, uh, and it's always of God, of course, and the Scripture says there in Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love 22. and joy. Galatians 5, 22. Love and joy. And if you have a look at Acts 13, verse 52, you always notice that uh, when the source of joy is mentioned in the Bible, it's always associated with the Spirit of God. Acts 13, and verse number 52, and the Scripture says there, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And so there's that correlation there between the Holy Spirit and joy. That's why you can't have proper joy if you're not a Christian, because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Only Christians have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, and only Christians are temples of the Holy Spirit. Have a look at Romans 14 and verse number 17. Romans 14 and verse number 17. And the Bible says there, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace, notice this, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And of course we already read earlier and Rudy read for us, The joy of the Lord is our strength. So genuine joy comes through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God gives us genuine joy. Only He can give us peace and contentment and satisfaction and assurance that I am His and He is mine. That's what creates joy, come what may. And you can compare that, can't you, with earthly joy, of course, which is temporary and fleeting. You know, it was a month or so since Christmas now, and all of our some unsafe friends got their new gizmos, and they got excited about it, and they got joyful about it, but now, of course, all the novelty's worn off, and all that joy's gone, so they need something else to bring them joy. But the Holy Spirit of God gives us joy, so that's the first thing. So where does genuine joy come from? Well, it's supernatural, as from God. It's not something we can conjure up or manufacture by hallelujah, praise the Lord, rolling down the aisles. It's something which is in our hearts, which God gives us for a certainty. And that's great to know, isn't it? Now, the second question to answer tonight is, how does the Bible describe genuine joy? And it's really quite interesting to have a look at this. Because when we talk about joy, sometimes we say, well, uh, how does God describe it in the scriptures? And he really describes joy in three different ways. We're talking about this genuine supernatural joy now. The first way the Bible describes joy, that God describes it as being filled with joy and being full of joy. So we're filled with joy and we're full of joy. This is a natural, normal Christian life. That we're filled with joy and we're 
full of joy. Have a look in John chapter 15 and verse 11. And it's interesting to see how often the phrase being full of joy is mentioned in the scripture. John chapter 15 and verse number 11. And Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, in you. Notice this. And that your joy might be full. In other words, we're to be full up with joy. Not full up with junk, but full up with joy, according to the Bible. Have a look at John 16 and verse number 24. And again Jesus says here, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. So there's that little statement again. Have a look at 1 John. 1 John, uh, uh, toward the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 4. And the Bible says, and, and John writes here, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So three times we've seen that fullness mentioned. Have a look at 2 John, verse number 12. 2 John and verse number 12. And the Bible says there, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full and so there's this fullness of joy which God is talking about have a look at Romans 15 and verse number 13 Romans 15 and verse number 13 and remember to get an overall view of a subject in the Bible or a topic you need to take scripture with scripture here in Romans 15 and verse number 13 the Bible says there now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and then in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 4, remember we're looking at the first description of Bible joy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 4, and the scripture says here, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. So uh, we read a number of statements, about five there, where we're told that we should be full of joy. And then a few verses where we should be filled with joy. So the thought is that we're bubbling over with God's joy. Amen. You know, there was an old Pentecostal man in Corby when we were there at the Assemblies of God. And obviously we didn't agree with everything he was into. But he used to say to me, Brother Colin, you need to be start raving mad with joy. <laughs> you know? And the thought is, of course, we're bubbling over with joy. And that's the picture. Full up and filled up with joy and so the first bible description is we're filled with joy and full of joy and the second bible description is that this joy is unspeakable and the word unspeakable in the bible means we can't describe it with normal human language because it's so wonderful have a look in 1 peter chapter 1 and verse number 8 1 peter chapter 1 and verse number 8 I can't describe fully the joy I've felt for the past 35 years knowing Jesus. But I know it's unspeakable, even though I can't describe it. Here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible says about Jesus, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. In fact, there's a hymn, isn't there, Rosalind? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I think it's in the soul stirring songs, uh, hymns of the faith. Great song, joy unspeakable. And so joy is described as being full of joy. Joy is described as unspeakable because it's so magnificent, because it's supernatural. We can't just go and buy it from Curry's or Tesco's. God gives it to us. And then joy is also described in the Bible as exceeding joy and great joy. We saw in our opening verse there in Jude 24 that Jude talks there about exceeding joy and elsewhere we find that joy is described as great joy. Have a look here again in 1 Peter 4 and verse number 13. 1 Peter 4 and verse 13 and here the Bible says, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad with exceeding joy. And Jude mentions that same term in verse 24, the exceeding joy. 
And then you may remember in the Christmas story, in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 10, if you just take a look at that, Luke chapter 2 and verse number 10, again joy is spoken of, and here the shepherds come to announce the good news of Jesus. And in verse number 10 the Bible says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And great joy and exceeding joy is mentioned a number of times in the scripture. So here's the umbrella description of joy, which is different to anything you can get from anything from this world. It's full of joy. It's filled with joy. It's exceeding joy. It's great joy. And it's unspeakable joy. What fortunate people we are, so Brother Pambakian would say. Isn't it wonderful to have the joy of the Lord as our strength as Nehemiah recorded for us. So, genuine joy is supernatural from God, and it has all these wonderful descriptions, which actually we can't describe, but we stand on what the Bible says about it. And so, people will say, well, if this joy is so great then, what causes us to have this joy? How can we enhance this joy and encourage this joy? in our Christian lives. How could I leave Calvary Baptist Church tonight on Sunday the 31st of January and be happy and joyful every day from now on till Jesus takes me to heaven? How can I do that? How can I have this genuine joy? Because that actually is how we should be, folks. We should have this quiet peace and contentment. I'm not talking here about an insurance policy against problems. If you don't have problems as a Christian, you ain't a very good witness, let me tell you that. The more problems you have, that means the more effective you are for Jesus. Because the devil don't like you. But through all of that, you can have joy. And there's certain steps to take whereby you can secure that joy and guarantee that joy for your own personal life. I want to show you some of these things. So the third question is then, what causes a Christian to have genuine Bible joy? And it isn't the fact that suddenly you win the lotto, you shouldn't be doing the lotto, a lotto anyway, but that doesn't bring you joy. You know, what causes, what gives you, what, what enables you, what helps are there to have this genuine joy? Well, as you read the Bible, we see quite a few things which enhance this genuine joy. And the first thing which is absolutely clear in the scriptures is, genuine joy comes from reading the Bible. You can't have genuine joy if you don't read the Bible. So if you're not feeling very joyful, it may be you haven't read the Bible today. But genuine joy definitely emanates from reading the Bible. I want to prove that to you. Have a look at 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 6. So if you're not a consistent Bible reader, you're probably going to be a miserable Christian. That's actually the bottom line of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 6. And here the Bible says... 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 6. And the scripture says there, And ye became followers of us. Now remember, Paul's writing this letter to the church at Thessalonica. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So when you read the word of God and receive the word of God, It gives you joy. It gave the early believers joy. It gave them sustenance through great difficulty. So we have to read the scriptures. Have a look at the book of Jeremiah. Even poor old Jeremiah, the prophet who was a weeping prophet, he managed to find joy. And one of the ways he found that joy was through reading the scriptures. Jeremiah 15 and verse number 15 and 16. And the Bible says there, O Lord, in verse number 15 of chapter 15, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. But notice verse number 16. Thy words were found, the word of God in other words, thy words were found and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy of and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So you notice there that reading the word of God brings joy. So if we don't read the word of God, the chances are we're going to be somewhat dearth of 
Bible joy. So it's really, really important that you should read the scriptures. So if you find you don't have the joy I'm talking about tonight, it may be you're not reading the scriptures sufficiently. It's God's sustenance. Now the second thing we find which causes Bible joy and enhances Bible joy is that genuine joy comes from walking in the truth. Genuine joy comes from walking in the truth. This is really important. One of the reasons why so many Christians are miserable is they're not really walking in the truth. You know, there's lots of nutters in the world. Have you noticed that? Uh, and I've met, even up there in the northeast of England, most people have been very gracious to us, but I've, read, I've met some real people who claim to be Christians, and actually they're nothing but nutcases. And the reason why, why that is, is they're not walking in the truth. You know, they've got the, all the language, but they're not walking in the truth. But you must stand on the truth of the Word of God. If your doctrine's wrong, you can't have joy. That's really what the Bible teaches. Have a look here in 3 John and verse number 4. 3 John and verse number 4. So walking in the truth and getting your doctrine is really, really important. And even sometimes our happy, clappy friends, you know, they may talk about joy, but if they're not standing on the Word of God, it's impossible to have this inner joy, according to the Bible. Look at two, um, 3 John uh, and verse number 4, and the Bible says there, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Amen. You cannot have Bible joy if you're mixed up in false doctrine. It's impossible. That's why you never see a Jehovah Witness smile. You don't. They're just miserable, aren't you? You know? And that's why sometimes when the Mormons are cycling along on their bikes, I mean, I try to be gracious, but I, I, I say to them, look, folks, look, guys, if you just got saved, God may buy you a car. Yeah. <laughs> and then you might be more joyful. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, isn't it, that we can't have joy unless we stand on the truth. Because otherwise we're all going to be fuzzy and muddled up, aren't we? So, genuine joy comes from reading the Bible. It comes from walking in the truth. But also genuine joy comes from going to the house of God. Should be a joyful experience, you know to come to the house of the Lord. Have a look at Ezra chapter 6 and verse number 16. Ezra chapter 6 and verse number 16. And it's uh, really, really important that we should be in the house of God. And when Christian, when people say to me on the doors, well, my religion is private and I practice it at home, something wrong with that, folks. You know, when I come down this morning, even though we, we, I got up at 4.30, I was excited about seeing you. Uh, and that was going to be a blessing because we're coming into the house of the Lord. So Ezra chapter 6 and verse number 16 says, And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity, kept the dedication of the house of God with joy. See, they went into the house of God and it gave them joy. If you have a look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. Again, uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, there was an element of excitement about mixing with God's people. 2 Timothy 1 and, and verses 3 and 4. And joy was associated with this. And the Bible says there, I thank God, whom I serve with my forefathers, with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, you see, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. So Paul says, Timothy, I'm excited about seeing you. I'm excited about seeing other believers. Why? Because it fills me with genuine, supernatural Bible joy. Amen. And so if you're not in church, you're going to be miserable. That's the bottom line of it. If you're not meeting with like-minded brothers and sisters. So genuine joy comes from reading the Bible. If you're not a Bible student, you'll never have proper joy. Genuine joy comes from walking in the truth of the Word of God. It comes from coming to the house of God. And it comes through mixing and fellowshipping with other of God's people. Now, genuine joy also, according to the Bible, comes through giving to God. Giving to God. Sacrificially giving to God, maybe through the tithes and offerings or, or, or just in time, brings a certain joy. Uh, it appears that when you sacrifice for God, he repays you in giving you this joy and encouraging 
this joy. Have a look, if you would, at um, Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse number 43. There was a lot of sacrificing in time and effort in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah realized that there was great joy to be had because of these things. Nehemiah 12 and verse number 43. And the Bible says there also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoice for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. And all that joy of the husband, the wife and the children is because they gave to God. And so there's a joy in giving to God. So the more you give to God, the more likely is, uh, Jonathan, that um, Natalie's going to be happy. And the more you sacrifice, Natalie, for the things of God and for Jonathan, the chances are you're going to have that joy. It, it works. If everybody in the family sacrifices for God in the way in which God has led, led them to, well, then they'll have that joy. Now, of course, genuine joy also comes from personally being saved. Let me tell you tonight, if you're unsaved tonight, not only are you a wicked sinner unsaved and you're not going to heaven you can never have joy you can never have joy have a look at Isaiah 12 and verse number 3 if you would Isaiah 12 and verse number 3 and the Bible says there notice this talking about salvation therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation you know, when that man was saved in Acts chapter 3, the, the, the paralyzed man, and Peter and John prayed for him, and the Bible says that he went walking and leaping and praising God. He was a joyful man. He'd encountered Jesus. Everybody who had encountered Jesus genuinely in the Bible and was genuinely saved, well, they experienced great joy. So we can only have joy from being personally saved, we can also have joy, and I'll give you the references for time's sake, knowing that our names are written in heaven. Have a look at, uh, write down if you would, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. The Bible also says in Acts chapter 15 and verse number 3, that we can have genuine joy by seeing other people saved. In the book of Acts, as the gospel went out to the Gentiles, we're told that the apostles had great joy. And we should get excited and joyful, shouldn't we, when we see other people saved. And so all of these things are encouragements and strengths to us having this Bible joy. But if you're not saved here tonight, you haven't even gotten the first rung of the ladder and you need to be saved. Now, I've already said there's a number of descriptions of Bible joy. That's great joy, being filled with joy, joy unspeakable. But also there's three types of joy in the Bible. Christian joy, supernatural joy. And I just want to show you these very quickly. We'll soon be through. The first one is, on question number four this is, what types of genuine joy are there? The first one is, there's everlasting joy. The Bible talks about everlasting joy. Have a look at Isaiah 35 and verse number 10. And in this way you can see that this joy is completely diametrically opposed to any joy which um, the world can give you. Isaiah 35 and verse number 10 says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So there's, there's everlasting joy. And for the Christian, of course, that starts on the day we're saved and it's never going to end. Praise God for that. Have a look at Isaiah 61 and verse number 7. This isn't just something fleeting or temporary. This is something permanent because God guarantees it. Isaiah 61 and verse number 7 says, For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double, double everlasting joy shall be upon them. So if you're saved here tonight, there's no reason why you shouldn't have everlasting joy. God guarantees it. So you can leave here tonight, and if you don't have joy, 
You can do these things to allow God to strengthen your joy, and you can know that it's everlasting. Isn't it great that the devil can't take your joy away? Isn't it wonderful that David Cameron can't take your joy away? Isn't it wonderful that nobody can snatch your joy away? And uh, Brother Rudy was mentioning about agro at work. There's always agro. What a wicked world we live in. You know, we live in a secular world where you're constantly under pressure from people at work. But thank God they can't touch your everlasting joy. Because you're in the Lord, aren't you? So there's everlasting joy. And in fact, the Bible says, this is uh, the second type, there is a joy that no man can take away. Have a look at John chapter 16 and verse number 22. John's Gospel chapter 16 and verse number 22. And the Bible says there, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and notice this, and your joy no man taketh from you. Perhaps if you remember nothing about this message tonight, that's the verse to underline, isn't it? Isn't that a great verse? And your joy, which of course God gives you, but we've already seen that supernatural joy, and your joy no man taketh from you. Underline that verse. It's a great verse, isn't it? And then, of course, there's the other type of joy, which comes through affliction. There's a certain joy from God which comes through affliction. In other words, if you fall over and break your leg this week, you should rejoice. Because you can learn something from it. And if you have the right attitude to it, you're going to grow in joy. Notice this. There was great affliction in Bible days, folks. But they didn't get depressed. They carried on and they learnt through it. Have a look at 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number uh, 2, if you would. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number 2. And the scripture says there... Let's read verse number 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So here were some disciples having lots of aggravation, but actually their joy was overflowing. God was teaching them something through this affliction. And of course, if you go to that well-known passage in the book of James, James makes it absolutely clear that affliction can create joy. It's completely paradoxical, isn't it? But that's what the Bible says. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. And the Bible says there, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the joy, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And so, there's everlasting joy. Praise God for that. There's a joy that no man can take away. And then there's a joy that actually you only really experience through affliction. There you are, you're laying there on the hospital bed. The doctor's just announced you've got terminal cancer. You've got three months to live. Is that a cause to get depressed, according to the Bible? No, no, it's a cause to grow. It's a cause to get more joyful. Because soon you're going to see Jesus face to face. What can be better than that? So, there is that joy, everlasting joy, and so, don't, don't shun affliction. If God's allowed it to come your way, it hasn't caught him by surprise, be prepared to grow in joy through it. And then point number five, why do many Christians not experience genuine joy? Well, it's pretty obvious from the scriptures that if we're not experiencing genuine supernatural joy, it's always the fault of the Christian. It's never the fault of God. God hasn't changed. He's unchangeable. It's always our fault. So if the reason why we do or the reason why we do not experience genuine joy with God is very often because of sin, the Bible makes that quite clear. And so perhaps we need to look at our personal circumstances. You see, if there's sin in our lives, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, and we pray to God, the Bible says he doesn't hear our prayers. That's not because God's going deaf, because God don't go deaf. But it's because our sin blocks our relationship with him. And so we need to fundamentally, concretely deal with that so that God can restore our joy again. Notice in uh, Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse number 33, sin is a joy robber. And so we need to deal with it so we can be restored. God longs to give us that joy. It's normal for us to have that joy. But we shortcut his joy or short circuit his joy 
because of sin. The situation here in Jeremiah and of course the book of Lamentations was that the people's joy was taken away. Not that God wanted to do it, but they caused him to have to do it because of their sin blocked fellowship with God. Here in Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse number 33 the Bible says, And joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. And I have caused wine to foul from the winepress. None shall tread with shouting, their shouting shall be no shouting. So God says, you're in a sinful condition, I'm going to take your joy away. So if you're missing joy tonight, in the way I've described it, it may be that you're not walking right with the Lord. Have a look at the next book, the book of Lamentations. And boy, when you read through the book of Lamentations, as Jeremiah looked over the desolation of Jerusalem, there was not one ounce of joy there. And the reason wasn't that God didn't want them to have joy, it was that they sinned and blocked God's joy. Have a look in Lamentations 5 and verse number 15. The joy of our heart is ceased. What a sad statement that is. The joy of our heart is ceased. Our dance is turned into mourning. And so let's get right with God and God can restore our hearts again and restore our joy. And then finally, as I mentioned to start with, what on earth do we say to our football crazy friend when he says, I don't need the joy of Jesus because I've got the joy of Manchester United? What do we say to that, you know? You're going to be confronted with that time and time again. And then somebody says, I don't need Jesus because I've got all this money in the bank or I drive a Rolls Royce or the latest version of an Audi car. What do you say to that? You get people like that, don't you? That's like, they say, I'm satisfied with that Jesus. I don't need that joy. Well, what you have to do, folks, is you have to remind them that there is such a thing as false joy in the Bible. Joy which is conjured up through the imagination of man's mind, which we know is only temporary. And the fact is that apparent joy, if you're not saved with Manchester United, is not only not genuine Bible joy, it also won't last for eternity. A man can take it away if Manchester United lose. So there's a false joy, you see. Have a look at Matthew chapter 13. This is our last verse for tonight. Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, if you will, in the New Testament. And verses 20 to 21. There's actually a lot that the Bible says about false joy. We haven't time to cover that this evening. So Matthew 13 and verse 20 and 21. And the Bible says there, and of course I know Pastor Jonathan has gone through some of these parables. But this, of course, is the parable of the sower. And in verse number 20, the Bible says, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word by and by, he is offended. And there's the false joy of the world. There's that joy which springs up for a season and then collapses when 101 things go wrong. So here's the football fan, you see. He psyched himself up for a whole six months from Manchester United to win the FA Cup. And then for some reason they lose. And for all that six months he had joy because they looked as though they were going to make it. And then their goal is broken and their joy is nothing and it faileth. That's false joy. So when your friend gets excited about his new Rolls Royce, it's false joy. He still needs Jesus because false joy is not everlasting joy. It's joy that man can take away, whereas we have a joy that no man can take away. And so Bible joy is really important. We've only just scratched the surface tonight, but we've seen that Bible joy is genuine if it comes from the Spirit of God. It's full joy, unspeakable joy, great joy, exceeding joy. And the way to maintain that joy is through reading the scriptures, walking in the truth, going to the house of God, meeting with other believers, sacrificial giving, and of course being personally saved, without which no one can have this joy. Seeing others saved causes joy. Our names written in heaven causes joy. And then, as I've mentioned, there's the everlasting joy as a description. The joy that no man taketh away, and the joy that cometh through affliction. If you're afflicted this week, 
Well, accept it. Use it as a springboard to grow in grace and in joy. So make sure that we sort our lives out and then we can make sure there's a clean channel. Nothing between my God, uh, between my soul and my Saviour. I think we sing that sometimes. And then we can have that joy restored. There is no reason for any of us to be miserable, moaning minis this week. Because God's in charge. He loves us. We love Him. Walk with Him. Come what may. Even if the stock market collapses, even if the third world war breaks out, we can still have the joy of the Lord, as Nehemiah said. Thank God for that. Thank you, Pastor John. I feel that. Amen. <laughs>